Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalam ala rasulillah sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika arhamar rahmin So inshallah today uh, with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we return back to seerah and if you've been listening to my seerah I have finished the whole Meccan seerah already and we also started the Medinan period and we are in the early stages of Medinan period. We spoke about some of the early uh, events that happened in Medina particularly. Uh, today, inshallah, we're going to start with uh, the battles. I and mean, the battles are a very, very uh, important concept in Islam. And when you say the word jihad, the American satellites, you know, they're set on you. And often people run away from saying these words. Now you never know the American satellites on top of Rouse Hill at the moment because we said the magic word. You know, when I was growing up in England, back then the magic words were thank you, please and sorry. But now the magic words jihad. So uh, today, inshallah, I'll give you some uh, background of jihad as well. Some of the things why jihad is very, very important. Unfortunately, there are two communities of uh, the sellouts, well, I wouldn't call them Muslims. One are in Marsden Park, not far away from here. And they're the ones who actually uh, said jihad was uh, abolished and there's no jihad. The only jihad you can do is the jihad against your children when they're watching TV. Uh, and there were other kinds of jihad they allowed. The jihad were on your exams with your pen. And there were other kinds of that. But if you don't know what that community is, it's called Ahmadiyya community, really backed up community. I got a very beautiful synagogue. Oh, that was an insult to the Jewish people actually, not even a synagogue. I don't know what to call it. If you figure out of a good name, you let me know, inshallah. But um, they, they have something which they uh, call Baytul Huda. In Arabic, Huda means guidance. You can call it Baytul Shar. I mean, there's no guidance in that house which they have. So that's the Ahmadiyya community, the Qadiani community. The other community also is a sellout part of Islam as well. Le and later on, they don't say they're Muslims anymore. It's the Baha'i community. And they also said the jihad's been abolished and no jihad's uh, allowed anymore. And understand, you know, if you talk about jihad, very, very simply, I mean, or what we have on hands. Jihad means to resist. Okay, that's the linguistic meaning in Arabic. Now, that resistance is of three levels when it comes to Islam. The first level is your nafs. It's something within yourself. You have to resist temptation and everything around you. And then the second one is shay shaitan. You know, shaitan's back because when Ramadan's over, and the best friend, uh, unfortunately, a Quran says, Aduwum Mubin, that is your clear enemy. But the, the kind of, uh, today we have more shaitan, more closer to us than we have anything else in our life. And then um, the other thing is fighting against the enemy. And that could be both offensive and that could be defensive as well. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about jihad in Surah Hajj. And those are the early ayahs. Now, when it comes to um, the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, jihad had four stages. The first 13 years was just the jihad against your nafs and shaitan. And there was a temptation around the dunya. And there was a reason for it, inshallah. I'll explain you that reason. And the second, after the 13 years when they migrated to Medina, the second level of jihad was only against the Quraysh. 
and which we are going to learn today and how Quraysh and the reasons why it was against the Quraysh and also in that jihad only the Muhajirun were permitted to fight against the Quraysh. No Ansar was sent to fight against the Quraysh, which probably you, you will inshallah learn that today. A reason being, when the pledge of Aqaba was done, it was said clearly that the Ansar will defend the Muslims. I was never told that they will go out. That was not mentioned in that pledge and there's other reasons as well. And also the third level of jihad was when they defended themselves from all the skirmishes that were happening in the region and also were inshallah in two sessions today and after the next one in the next session i'm not here i, I have a talk in quakers hill masjid so i'm not going to be here uh, next friday so if you want to listen to me if you really miss me you can see me there at 7 30 same day inshallah oh, I'm, I'm actually speaking about jihad <laughs> So, so yeah, it's, uh, at the moment, you know, subhanAllah, Muslim, as you know, very reactive community. Right now, uh, Aqsa needs all the Muslim speakers, and every Muslim speaker is just speaking about jihad at the moment. And jihad again. <laughs> it's a lot of jihad happening. And uh, you know, you never know, your phones are going to be tapped now, and the ASIO is not going to be very happy when your wife's scolding you on the phone. <laughs> So, uh, anyways, I mean, ASIO really loves uh, tapping the Muslim phones. I mean, they don't get anything apart from just bring. And when the wife just angrily says, you didn't bring the milk, you didn't put the rubbish outside. And ASIO is like, we're just wasting $70,000 on these agents to spy on these guys, poor, mesquite men who are afraid of their wives. So, unfortunately, they didn't invest the money in the right place. Uh, anyways, let's go back to the, what we have in, in hand. Uh, you know, I, I'll tell you one thing, and this is no exaggeration. Um, I asked, uh, if you know you're from the Pakistani community, you love chapati uh, or roti, you know, whatever you want to call it. So, what I was asking the children, you know, amongst you, who do you think whose dad is the most strongest? One of the child said, my dad's the strongest. And I'm like, what? Well, what do you mean? I mean, can you explain? He said, my dad eats eight chapatis. I'm like, mashallah, you know, the, now the strength is defined on chapatis. <laughs> so we gave your dad khubs, which is the Lebanese bread. He's probably going to eat the whole packet. So unfortunately, that's what the strength has come down to. So the strength of your dad is with the eight chapatis. And poor thing, the wife has to cook eight chapatis for making that father strong. But this is how we've come down to, if you really look at the Muslims, I mean, not picking on anyone, uh, the, car, the Muslims that you see today, when they stand in the rows, it's their bellies that are in front of them. And, they, and then you have these Muslims, you know, they, do you think they're gonna do any jihad? Our fathers, the fathers cannot even do jihad against the children to tell them what to watch and what not to watch. They can't even do that jihad today. So let alone they're going to save anyone. Uh, so, uh, but very quickly, now Islam gives some rules of engagement. And Malik's Mu'atta, uh, the Hadith of Mu'atta actually mentions some of the rules as well. And there are other Hadith as well. I've actually collected uh, about 10 over here. And I'll quickly explain you. And you know, what's the irony? Now, if you know, um, me well, I, I like to pick on the Western people a lot. And I do think, you know, Muslims are not allowed to defend their honor. That's the irony, because if anyone fires a rocket from Gaza to save his family, he's a terrorist. And on the other end, if you've got IDF sending bombs upon bombs, they're just defending themselves. So that's the irony. Now, let me tell you about one of the jihad that happened. And now you make it yourself if that was jihad or not. In 1773, America went on war with the British company. Do you know what was the reason for that? Anyone knows the reason? Because the British raised the taxes for the price of tea. That's documented. It's called the Tea Act. 
So they raised the price of tea and America had every right to go on jihad. Why? Because the prices of tea was expensive. So they were fighting for their rights. If you think that's jihad and that's allowed, so I think, you know, Muslims should be allowed to definitely defend themselves. That's the irony that we live in. The world that we live in today is completely warped. And so just very quickly, the rules of engagement. Islam is a religion which came with all the benefits that you can see. Number one, no child, no women, no elderly people should be harmed in war. Now, if you were to look at the Western Jihad, what they're doing, the first thing they do is they harm the children. 70 plus children died in that 10 day skirmish that happened between the tyrants and the Muslims. 145 people died, elderly, families, women, children. And then you've got the second uh, most important thing is when they go, they do not kill the cattle as well. If they see any cattle around, they do not kill, except for the ones they need for their food. They can only slaughter the animals if they need it for their food. Also, Muslims will not go uprooting the trees and the crops and not break or not uproot the trees which are fruit bearing trees. They're not going to do that. Also, Muslims, when they fight, they're not going to strike on the face. And that's for the Pakistani fathers as well, you know, and myself included. When you do hit your children, do not hit on the face. SubhanAllah, we grew up, and I mean, the fathers, that the only spot they loved was face. But face is something that we should not be striking on. This is something mentioned in the time of war. When you have to be the most attentive, that do not strike on war. The hadith says that humans are created in the image of Adam alayhi salam. You know, the Christian says that you're created in the image of God. But that's not what we believe. We believe that we are created in the image of Adam alayhi salam. Because that was the first human. So we're not allowed to strike on people's faces. When you attack, you do not strike on the face. And moving on, do not kill people in the monasteries, in the churches, in the synagogues, the ones who are sitting inside their places of worship. We cannot kill them. SubhanAllah, no, not to get started, if you were here yesterday, how did the conflict start? They went inside the masjid, started killing people. Islam gives a clear ruling that we do not kill anyone inside the places of worship. And do not destroy villages, towns, and do not destroy gardens and fields where crops are cultivated. Now, if you look at the other people, when the bombs are coming down, they are destroying, completely annihilating the towns, the buildings, the houses. And this is what Islam was never about. Islam actually gave guidelines to that as well. And one of the most important things for the younger people over here, do not ask for war. This is another thing which is mentioned, that do not seek war. And always pray for security and peace. But if the war is imposed on you, then do not run away. Now you have to fight. As a Muslim, you have to fight. And you know the last battle which will happen just when everything is Al-Malhamatul Kubra, the great battle which is going to happen. Did you know that one third of the people will run away from the war? And the Hadith says they'll be the worst of the people on the face of this earth, that they ran away from the battlefield. It's a major sin when the battle is engaged and it's ready that you run away. And we're going to learn this in Battle of Uhud, Abdullah ibn Ubay was the one who actually ran away with one third of the army. He did not participate just when the battle was engaged because he said he's not going to fight. We're going to learn this inshallah. And also, do not punish anyone by fire if you are victorious because Allah is the one who will punish people by fire on the day of judgment. We're not allowed to punish anyone by fire as humans. If we were to give anyone a punishment, it cannot be fire. You cannot burn someone. Because this is something only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the, um, 
the ayah of Quran in Surah Tahrim, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to all of us, me and you, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. To save your families and yourself from the fire. Because Allah is saying the fire is something that I will punish you on the day of judgment. And that's not for me and you. And do good and practice good, even though those people had done evil to you. Now, if you remember Salahuddin al Ayyubi, when he attacked the Crusaders and he went into Baytul Maqdis, what did he do with the Crusaders and the army? He did not kill how they killed the Muslims when they took over that. He allowed them to go and they were set free. He did not punish or annihilate people. This is how Muslims work. This is the, the way how Muslims deal with people. And, you know, we can, and these are the most important 10 rules of engagement. Now, very quickly, inshallah, uh, understand jihad is something that we cannot run away from. Jihad will always be there. But now in order to understand for the children that sit over here, jihad is not when some uh, crazy ISIS or these people are calling people to come and fight. It doesn't work like this. Jihad has some rules and it's done by the Emir, it's done by the Khalifa who calls upon it. It's the leaders who call upon it. It cannot be done in a masjid where I am over here and I'm telling you now we're going to go and fight. It doesn't happen like this. Like one person coming up with his own opinion and causing a lot of destruction. Every time if you look at the history, whenever you see the history, and often you know brothers from another mother, which is our brothers who are the Shia brothers, and I call them brothers from another brother and mother. Why? Because they always use these arguments that what happened in the past that Muawiyah went. Understand both were the leaders when they fought. Ali radiallahu an fought with Muawiyah. There were two battles. The Sunni children, we don't know much about battle. We don't teach our children. Because these are all political things and if we start speaking about them, we're only going to make it hard for ourselves. There were battles that they fought. Between them, 25,000 Sahabas died. Between both the armies. But destruction that happened after the death of Usman is amazing. How Muslims fought against each other. And you know what? It carried on. And it carried on to the time of Hussein as well. When he went to stand against the army of Yazid and what happened to him. And we know, radiallahu anhu, we, and but what uh, the brothers from another mother do not understand, they exaggerate the situation. Everything about them is exaggeration. You look at them, they only become Muslim for the first 10 days of Muharram. And they just get together and they're beating themselves, they're crying and they're doing all these theatrics. And when you look at their practices, all exaggeration, asking the Imams for mercy, for food, for everything. You look at when they go to Iraq, they worship the graves and they do all these things. That's all exaggeration. And Islam is not that. Islam is something where we have to be in the middle, that we understand both sides and understand for me and for you, all of us, we need to know that Muawiyah is a Sahabi of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ali radiallahu an is also a Sahabi of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also the son-in-law of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also the cousin, but we understand Ali's position was right but it doesn't mean Muawiyah on the other hand was evil, no Muawiyah was a mujtahid and he took a judgment based on his ijtihad that he fought. And so if, if you know the hadith of mujtahid, if a mujtahid makes a mistake, what happens? He still gets one reward. But if he gets it right, he gets two rewards. So Muawiyah radiallahu an, whatever he did, he acted not upon his impulse, upon his ijtihad, because he was a knowledgeable man. So inshallah, we'll put a bed to that matter, but moving on inshallah. Now, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa arrived in Medina, now one of the things you need to understand, he's establishing a society. And when you establish a society, there's a lot of things that's required. So three aspects of a society which we are going to speak about today is the economic policies. And the second one is 
uh, spiritual development and the third and the last one is the political and then the military development so we're going to speak about the some of the battles some of the early skirmishes that happened so now the economic policy now you i'm not going to go into much detail it's not relevant to the topic uh, to the course a lot but understand the jews were the most important people and they lived in the outskirts and all the markets were owned by them and they were the ones who were making the money and everything what not so this was more like uh, the communist society the way they were doing the trade if you know uh, how the communists work and the Russia when it came to power how they worked and how they pushed uh, their agendas so this is very very similar to that the Jews had all the markets Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he visited one of the markets of the Jews he was not very happy the way they cheated the way they lied and he was like he said uh, came back to the masjid and he drew this line and he says that the this is the line so that line basically in a message while he was doing the speech what he was trying to say that we do not have to go and do trade with them and buying from them establish your own markets in the city of medina not close to the houses but in places where there are no houses so establish your own market so later on the central souk of medina was actually established and this is where the muslims started doing trade and if you remember Abdurrahman ibn Auf, I spoke about him a long time ago. Maybe I can't remember, but we spoke about him. He was a billionaire Sahaba. And you know, I, I you always love all these other guys, Jeff Bezos and all the other ones who have billions and billions of dollars. And you've got the other guy, the Tesla guy, M Musk. Is he Musk? Yeah, so his name, even these names, you know, they're so hard, subhanAllah. But we had a billionaire 1400 years ago and it's mentioned his wealth was over 600 billion dollars and you know what he was actually no joblo he was not just a sahabi do you know what he was ashratu mubashirun the 10 that were promised paradise what was his name abdurrahman ibn auf and he was one of the ones who was promised paradise. So the souk was established and after that uh, it said uh, the souk was of the west of the masjid. So you know where you see the masjid today? It was actually where Baqiyah is. The west of the masjid is where Baqiyah is. Around there. Even today you have some uh, the date shops over there. If you look right in front of the masjid, if you've been to Medina, there's a lot of date markets over there. So that's where the real market was. It was established over there. So two conditions he laid, two simple rules. The first rule was all business must be done within this demarcated line. So that's where the market is, it should not exceed that. So basically one should not encroach other houses. So this is where the market will be. Second rule was no extra taxes. Why did he ask the Muslims to have their own? Because the Jews used to charge a lot of money. And subhanAllah, the Muslims have become like the Jews today. And again, not every Jew, you know, we should be very careful when we say that not everyone's uh, bad. There were the people, the majority of the people that were doing that. And this is exactly what Muslims have become to. If you guys have bought a house with the Muslim financing companies, mashallah, you know, the way they deal, it's exactly what this is saying. The second rule was no extra taxes. You go to a Muslim bank today, only why? Because you want to live... Uh, the Islamic way of life. Today, the conventional bank will give you interest on 2% or maybe a percent, I don't know. But a Muslim bank will charge you 9.5% to get you a house on a halal way. And this is what it is. And so, unfortunately, the practice has become like this. Now, second point, spiritual practices. All the spiritual practices became uh, you know, um, like uh, obligated in Medina, all of them. So the first of them, the first one they were asked to fast was the day of Muharram. Why? Because when he came to Medina, the Jews were fasting on the 10th. And he asked them why they're fasting. They said we fast because of Musa. And he asked everyone to fast on that day. Later on in the same year, just before Badr had started, 
what happened? Ramadan actually became compulsory. Same year after that, Zakatul Fitr became compulsory. Right after that, very soon, Zakatul Mal also became compulsory. Even, and the only one which became compulsory Hajj, that was the ninth year. And this is the year that he did Hajj. Prior to that, Hajj was not compulsory. The reason being, you all know. Why? Because Makkah was in hands of the Mushrikun. And it was very hard to do Hajj, so that's why it was not compulsory. So surely, uh, shortly but surely, everything is becoming uh, compulsory. Also, Salah, the real numbers of Salah actually became compulsory after coming to Medina. Remember I told you, now let's check your uh, memories now. How many raka'ah did they pray for every Salah? And I gave you, there's only one, the one uh, set of raka'ah they would pray for every Salah. How many did they pray before they arrived to Medina? And even when they arrived in Medina, how much was they, would they pray? Two. I said they would pray just two. Because that was the short prayer. Because they lived in Mecca and Mecca was in the land where they were being persecuted to pray. And what happened now? The four and the four and the three and the four for Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Isha became now. And this is soon after, you know, Zakatul Mal became compulsory, these numbers of Salah also were given to him. So all these things were happening. So spirituality also started during this time. Now finally, the political and the military development. And this is what we are going to spend our whole time today. And this is the first of the ayahs that came down in Surah Al-Hajj. And this is what we need to know. The ayah is uh, ayah number 39 and the ayah number 40. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظَلَمُوا وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ That permission has been granted to you to fight against the one who have wronged you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most competent to give you victory. And also after that, the, uh, another amazing ayah, this is actually more amazing than the earlier one because this describes that Allah's victory will come to the one who helps Allah. Allah's victory will never come. Now if we were to tie that with our situation today, subhanAllah, every year in Haram, every year in the Masajid, in Ramadan, people are making du'as, qunut, everyone's fasting, everyone's asking, why are we suffering the way we are suffering? And the answer is in this ayah that we're about to read. Why? Because if we are not helping Allah, how do you think Allah will help us? We have people that they are dealing in Haram and they go in the night and they pray to Allah, oh Allah, help us. Do you think Allah will help us? You have, subhanAllah today, and uh, Pakistan, mashallah, most of you are Pakistani, actually all of you are, wherever I see. So Pakistani weddings only are identified by the name of the bride and the groom. Where well, our weddings, full of haram, mashallah. And then we want Allah's victory. Most of us actually got married the haram way, actually. No exaggeration. We had the music going on, we were jumping up and down, we had everything happening. Mashallah, we never danced anywhere, but on our wedding day, we danced on the floor as if there was no tomorrow. And, and then we've got all these, even the child's very upset. He's like, I was a... It's like when I'm getting married, this Molvi has got a problem. <laughs> Don't worry, you can have dance on your wedding. <laughs> so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بِغَيْرِ حَقِّ إِلَّا أَنْ يَقُولُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهِ that they were kicked out of their houses without any just cause. Only why? Because they said Allah is their Lord. And this is exactly what's happening to the Muslims today as well. If you really look at it. وَلَوْ لَا دَفَعُ اللَّهِ بَعْدُهُمْ بِبَعْدٍ 
لهدمت سوامه وبيع السلا وبيع السلاوات ومساجد يذكر الله فيه اسم الله كثيرا that that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's checking upon the people and he is the one who is keeping an account of the people and they are the ones who are only in their masajids they are only saying the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are only mentioning the name of Allah and you want to demolish these places and you know what the real point is in there this is the point that I was saying wala yansuranna Allah man yansur and in arabic language if you know uh, if you know the arabic language well when allah uses the word lam with before any letter it's called lam at-tawkid allah says it will definitely happen that's called lam at-tawkid so the ayah is saying wala yansuranna allah man yansur that allah will surely give you victory if you are working for the cause of Allah now if we were doing everything what Allah destined me and you to do Allah will definitely give me victory Allah will definitely give you victory but the way we are dealing with our lives do you think the victory will come i don't think so the victory will come and that's why we all have to change our ways now just moving on very quickly uh we want to speak about the some of the things that were happening now understand the society of medina is made up of three people and whenever a new state is made it has a lot of uh, you know threats from outside you remember when me and you when we made our own state in 1947 we went on a war on the next year of that making of our country and that was a 1948 war with the neighboring country and so whenever a country is actually made it has a lot of threats because we are going through the country is going through a lot of changes now understand the three threats they had the first one was from quraish you all know that because they were unhappy with rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they wanted to come and kill them the second threat they had was from the pagans of aws and khazraj because they were not happy with rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam we spoke about majority of the people actually believed in rasul allah but there were people who did not believe in him and then the third threat he had was from the hypocrites and today i'm going to give you the two hypocrites now the two main hypocrites of medina all of you should know them one is abdullah ibn ubay as-salul now you know rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's way in medina was only paved why and aisha radhiyallahu anha said this we have spoken about this many times in the earlier parts When the Aws and Khazraj had this bloodiest war in their history all the first tier of the leaders had died and they were looking for another leader and when they were looking for another leader they had two people in mind one was Abdullah ibn Ubay as-Salul and the other guy was Abdu Amr Abdu Amr or Abdu Amr al-Rahib they would call him al-Rahib and these are the two guys they had in their mind because they were from the second tier of the leadership now abdullah ibn ubay when rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came into medina what did he do he was a very smart guy and he knew he said in order to come into power i have to be with the ones who are in power and he became a hypocrite and he accepted islam and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about him in the quran and also he is known in our religion as ra'sul munafiq the head of munafiq did you know the worst of the people on the day of judgment in the hell fire are the munafiqun because allah says in the quran wa darq al asfal an nar that they be right in the bottom levels of the hell fire even below the mushrikun and that is abdullah ibn ubay as-salul and he thought you know what i can become the part of the muslims and eventually I will get a chance to become the leader when Muhammad dies his enemies will kill him and I'll become the leader and that was his dream but the other guy Abdu Amr Al Amr Al Saifi Ibn Nauman or Abdu Amr Amr Al Rahib the other name he had he th- uh, left the country he went from Medina and he went back to Sham why was he called Rahib Rahib the Arabic word is the word for monk 
A monk is the one who actually gives his life for the sake of the religion and he does not get married, he just stays in the monastery. A monk could be anyone. I mean, we have this um, understanding that monks are only a Buddhist person. No, a monk could be a Christian monk as well, meaning he's just giving his life for the sake of uh, religion and he doesn't do anything. A Jewish person can be a monk as well. And there's no uh, the, the being monk in Islam. I mean, Islam does not endorse that. We cannot be rahib in Islam. I mean, this is something against the practice of religion. And that's why religion tells us to work in the community, to marry, to have children. And this is something that's part of our life. Now, why was he called rahib? Because he went to Sham a long time ago and he looked at the dressing of the monks and he liked it. And he would wear like that. And he would live a life like a monk as well. Showing that he was very righteous. When Rasulullah came in power, he got very upset. And he went and he left his uh, every belonging. He took everything and he went back to Syria. And he was never shown after that. Rasulullah when people would call him that uh, Abdul Amir al-Rahib, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, don't call him Abdul Amir al-Rahib, call him Abdul Amir al-Fasiq. And he said, because why? Because he is a wrongdoer, because he understood he had the message in front of him and he did not follow me. And this is why he was known as in the seerah, Abdul Amir al-Fasiq. Now, very quickly, uh, we believe that, uh, you know, um, that wars are only ghazwat, they call ghazwat, but there is another name for war as well. In the battles that Rasulullah participates himself, it's called ghazwa. And ghazwat is a plural. And in the battle that Rasulullah does not participate, it's called sariya. Sariya is the name for the battles where he did not participate. So this is something that you need to know because you're going to hear these names a lot now in the seerah. Also, in the fundamental stages, as I said to you, it was difficult for the Muslims to really establish something and it was becoming very hard for them. So, and they were, there was no safety, nothing. Then Allah actually revealed the ayah telling them the safety will come to you. Allah says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَا يَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْعَرْضِ كَمَا يَسْتَخْلِفَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that it's the promise of Allah, the ones who believe and the ones who do the right action, that Allah will change their situation on the land. How He changed the situation of the people before, the ones who came before. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي نَرْثَدَ لَهُمْ وَلِيُبَدِّ لَهُمْ وَبَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ آمَنَّ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change their places and Allah is pleased with them. From khawf, from fear to peace. And that time will come. And if you really know the history of Islam, you will know that Islam completely changed and how we became one of the most peaceful of the lands in the time of, uh, uh, you know, when Rasulullah sallallahu passed away in the time of the Khalifa, Usman and Omar were the really golden periods of Islam. And even after that, there were golden periods. I was telling something, sorry, I'm going on a tangent very quickly. I'm only going to take another 15 minutes and I'm done after that. And this time it is 15 minutes, I really guarantee you that. Um, I want to go on a tangent. Did you know that? How many people know the war of Halogu when he came, Halogu Khan, the, 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 the Mongol, when he came to uh, Baghdad? How many people know what happened on that day when they actually camped outside? They killed 800,000 people, that's what the history says. That's what the white history says. Our history says they actually killed a lot of people. And this is what the ayah going back to, you know, when I said Allah's help only comes to the people who help Allah. Now, I just remember this tangent and I want to mention it. I mean, what do you think? Uh, who knows the name of the Khalifa? It was an Abbasid Khalifa. Any child who knows the name of the Khalifa? Anyone? No one? It's the last of the Khalifas of the Abbasids. His name was Mustasim. 
Do you know Mustasim, when the army was waiting outside, this is what history says, I'm not making it up, he was watching his belly dancer dance. 120,000 soldiers were outside the fortress of Baghdad. Can you imagine the insanity of someone who's got an army waiting? It is said the Mongols fired an arrow which came through the curtain and killed the dancer. Do you know what Mustasim did after that? What do you think a sane person would do? He said he was unsatisfied. Can you bring another dancer till he's satisfied? And these are the Muslims. And that's what we are facing today. The insanity. This is what history says. History repeats itself. This is Mustasim, who was a Khalifa. Abbasids were very powerful. Although they were divided into factions, there were the Mamluks, there were other people as well. But they all gathered under the banner of the Khalifa. Guess what happened after that? You don't all know the history. Did you know when uh, the Mongols killed Mustasim, how did they kill him? He said, you're the dirt and you're filth on earth. You're more filthy than earth. They rolled him up in a carpet so that his body does not touch the earth. And they trampled him with the horses. That's how they killed him. Because even the Mongols realized that he was a filth on the earth. And he should not touch the ground like that. So this is what we're dealing with today, and that's why we're never going to change. We've got leaders, mashallah, they want to say everything. And to say it's easy, you know, I've been sitting here for approximately an hour, I've been talking. Talking is cheap. I can say anything, i said so many things as well. I mean, the real people are the ones who act, and the ones who have actions in their lives. So talking is very easy. You know, you've been telling your child, you're going to buy them the PS5. Is it easy to, buy, to really buy it? I don't know if Abdullah's got one. Abdullah, you got one? No, not yet. You want one? He, he's saying yes. Have you asked your dad yet? No. You can ask now. He's in a good mood. <laughs> All right. Anyways, now, going down to the Sharia. Now, the first of the battle... The first of the things that happened in, uh, and this is where Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he came, also the other thing very quickly, as a leader he knew his life was in danger, so he asked who will be his bodyguard. So the first of his bodyguards need to know if you, uh, someone asks you, was Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And he was the one who said, I will take the duty of guarding you. And he was the first one who actually guarded him. And the, uh, basically Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, he asked the people who will guard me. And it clearly shows that Muslims are the people who take precautions. We're not someone that we believe in Allah and we walk in front of the bullets. No, we're the ones who take precaution. He was the Nabi of Allah. He was guaranteed that he's not going to die on a battlefield. But even then, he's taking precaution. He would wear an armor. He would wear everything that was required to fight in the battlefield. Knowing that he will never die on a battlefield. He knew that. But it doesn't mean that we don't take precaution. You know, that's why, uh, you know, when you're driving your cars, wear your seatbelts. You know, take precaution. So precaution is very important. Now, the first of the Sari'a that happened was in the first year and of Ramadan. As soon as they've come, the first year of Ramadan came, that was the first of the Sari'a. And that was, they had to intercept the caravan of Abu Jahl. They knew that Abu Jahl's caravan's coming down, and they had to go and intercept that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam chose 30 muhajirun. All of them muhajirun. Remember when I started the lecture, I said in the early skirmishes, he never used anyone. It was only, he said, this was, why muhajirun? Why? Because these people, their lands were taken away. You know, when you came, you, most of you are muhajir. Like, not you, definitely, but your fathers. When they came from India, 
and they came all the way to Pakistan, you lost most of your belongings. Everything was gone. Your houses were gone. It was taken away unjustly. And what happened? They, they were not even given the money. They were kicked out. And now they wanted to take revenge. And they were allowed by Allah to do that. So the first Sari'a was sent. Only 30 people were sent. 30 people were sent to intercept the caravan where 200 people were there. And who was the one who was the leader of this caravan? The leader was none other than the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It was Abu Lahab. And he was coming down. Whose caravan was it? The enemy of Islam, Abu Jahl. And it was his caravan. Abu Lahab was the one who was actually bringing it. And it had a lot of, uh, you know, understand the traders of Mecca. If you know Surah Quraysh, Rihla tashita'i was safe. Allah actually made for them the journey. With the journey, they would do it, safe journeys. They would go in the summer in north, and in winter they would go Yemen. And that's how they would do their trade, and they were very rich. That was their security. So in order to really uh, damage them was to cut their lifeline. And Rasulullah knew where it would hurt. So if he would cut the trade route of Sham, they would not be able to do the trade that they were doing. And every journey to Sham had to go through Medina, the borders of Medina. So that's where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he sent this, the first army when it went, it went to the tribe called Bani Dumra. Bani Dumra was the area just about a few kilometers away from Medina and that's where they were coming from. When Bani Dumra found out that and who was the first leader? Does anyone know who was the first leader of this army? This Sari'a, sorry. Anyone may want to make a guess? Asadullahi wa Asadu Rasuli. Hamza was the leader made by Rasulullah for this army. And he was the one who actually went. Now two brothers are going to meet each other. Hamza is the brother of Abu Lahab. They have the same father. They have a different mother. Because Abu Jahl, if you know my seerah from, if you followed it from the beginning, we spoke about Abu Talib, uh, Abdul Muttalib had three wives. And from those three wives, he had these children. And Abu Lahab is also his child, and Hamza is also his child as well. So they go there, and Bani Dumra, when they find out, there is a leader called Najd ibn Amr. Najd ibn Amr, when he finds out, he's actually very upset. And he says, if you fight on my land, then you have to fight me before you fight Quraysh. And now Hamza has to make a decision. Hamza, what he does, he decides to go back. So nothing happens. Abu Lahab takes the caravan back. It's not intercepted and all is done. Now it was the month of Ramadan and the retreat happens. Now the second Sari'a, and this is the first of uh, the Sari'a, sorry, the second of the Sari'a, and this is in the month of Shawwal. And in the month of Shawwal, he finds out that Abu Sufyan is coming with a big caravan. And now he sends another cousin of his. And who is the cousin? Ubaidah ibn al Harith. Ubaidah ibn al Harith is the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he sends him to this Sari'a. And this is where the first of the arrows were for fired in the sake of Islam. And Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas is also sent. So basically, the Abu Sufyan is a very smart man. If you, inshallah, we're going to learn this. When he was a kafir as well, he's a very smart man. When he became a Muslim, it became strength to Islam as well. Also, everyone over here, don't be like from the brothers of another mother where Hind, we curse Hind and we curse Abu Sufyan, we curse his family. We've got no right to curse his family. He became Muslim. Rasulullah accepted his Islam. No matter what is in his heart, Allah knows it. For us, he's a Sahabi. And we will say he was a Sahabi. Now, understand this. If Allah wanted to kill him, we believe as Muslims, he had more Iman than any other tyrant, then Allah saved him. Did you know on the day of Badr, he was the only one who was not there? And this is again the hikmah of Allah. Every other tyrant was there and they all died. They all died on that day. He's the only one who was not there. And also what happens is, 
Actually, you know what? I'm just going to close over here. There's more battles as well. But I understand you guys are getting tired. Also, I'm going to ask you about some of the timings if you want to change it. But very quickly, let me finish this. And this was in the first year of Shawwal. Uh, sorry, the first year, which was the month of Shawwal. And after that, there was no battles for three months. Can you tell me why? Can anyone quickly tell me? There was no battle for three months. Yes. Yes. Ashhurul Hurum. So these were the three sacred months which are coming one after the other. So after this month of Shawwal, which I believe, which I believe most of you already finished your fasting, after this month there are three months that we're not allowed to do offensive jihad. It doesn't mean we cannot defend ourselves. We can defend ourselves, but we cannot fight. We cannot go and do an offensive jihad. So what are these months? Zil Qa'dah, Zil Hijjah, and Muharram. And then there is one more month it's in the middle, and who can tell me that month? There's another month, okay? There's a, so Allah kept it right in the middle. That's it. Rajab is the other one, which is right in the middle, that Allah actually kept it over there. Which is two months before Ramadan. So Rajab, Sha'ban, and Ramadan. So these three months, Sha'ban, Rajab, uh, Ramadan, and Shawwal, was that gap where you could actually engage in those wars. And most of the Muslim wars happen in the month of Ramadan, which we are going to learn, inshallah, in this seerah. And also, finally, just want to finish off over here, a big VIP dies before the Battle of Badr. Who can tell me a big VIP of Quraysh passed away? This is not just any VIP. He's the leader of Bani Makhzum, and he's the father of Khalid bin Walid, and he dies. He's the father of Khalid bin Walid. If you know Khalid bin Walid, that's his father. Did you know that Khalid bin Walid's father was the richest in the entire Quraysh? And I told you, if you know from my seerah, he was the only one when it was to change the cloth of Kaaba, he would do it alone. And in the next year, the whole eight tribes would contribute together to change the cloth of Kaaba with their money. But when it was his turn, he could do it individually and he dies. His name is Walid ibn Mughira. Walid ibn Mughira dies and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not choose him to die in that battle and he dies. After that is the first Ghazwa and this is called Ghazwa al-Abwa and we're not going to speak about it today inshallah. I will speak about this later uh, in the next class inshallah. And in the next class we're just going to look at some of the precursors of Battle of uh, Badr and inshallah, in one more class, after one more class, we'll start Battle of Badr. Battle of Badr, I want to do a very, very detailed, I might spend five sessions on it. I'm giving you a heads up. So it's the first of the battles, so I'll spend five hours on it at least. So um, we'll see if I can spend more as well, but I will spend a lot of time on it as well, inshallah, because this is a very important battle and we need to know that. And our children need to know this, what happened to the Muslims on that day. Now, just some uh, housekeeping things, you know, Salah has been moved to 7.45. Do you guys want to start early and pray home and go home? If that's the case, then we can start at 7 or even 6.45, depending on when you want to start. If we start at 7, then I can't speak much. Then I have to stop at 6, 7.45. Or I will keep it 7.45. I think it's okay. We'll just keep it 7.45. So inshallah, there's no class next week. If you don't get a message from me, I, I am at uh, my old place, Quakers Hill Masjid. And I'll see you guys there if you're coming over there. The topic is jihad. So make sure you keep your phones at home if you are coming for that lecture. Alright, if anyone's got any question, very quickly, any pressing question, I'm happy to answer it. Any pressing questions in your life? Actually, the other day, some, uh, uh, the brother actually asked me um, about two questions, and I only gave him a uh, very quick uh, answer, but I can actually deal with one of them now, and I can deal with one later. But if you've got any other question, I'm happy to answer that as well. Anyone's got a question? What were the two questions you asked? Well, I've got the answer by the way. So, uh, I think the question was, uh, <coughs> were the, message, the messages of all the uh, prophets 
for the same in the Quran. So why do we um, classify um, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the best of all? Okay, well, simple answer for that. Actually, it's mentioned. Well, you know why people debate? It's because in Surah Baqarah, it mentions about all prophets having the same ranks towards the end. But you need to understand that prophets were only sent to their nation. That's a simple answer. Only one prophet was sent to the entire humanity. And Allah actually mentioned that in the Quran as well. وَمَا أَرْسَلَّكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ that we were the ones who actually, and also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions him, Ra'ufur Rahim, that he's the one who's actually chosen to be the one, the mercy for the whole mankind. And there are many, many, many places where Allah speaks about being the leader of paradise and many, many other places. Why these uh, arguments are brought forward, it's only to belittle Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his ranks within Islam. But having said that, when people say, when Quran says all messengers are the same, meaning they were all chosen to give the message of Allah subhanahu wa taala. It does not mean, yes, some people have more ra ranks than the other. Quran mentions that ulil azmi anbiya, the five most important prophets. Quran even raises them as well. So in ranks are Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam number one, Ibrahim number two, number three is Musa, number four is Isa, and number five is Nuh alayhi salam. And these, these are mentioned in Quran, Ulul Azmi Anbiya, which is mentioned in one of the greatest surahs which you can actually read is Surah Araf, the story of Shaitan. Right after that, Allah actually mentioned about this. The miras, the contract that Allah actually took from the people. And in that it's mentioned that these are, that Allah took the contract for these five important messengers as well. And also Allah mentions that all the prophets took a contract, a covenant to believe in the message of Muhammad wasallam. And this is what Muhammad wasallam said, if Isa will come, he's going to follow me. So Isa salam will follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He will go to Hajj as well. He will pray five times a day. Even though he's a messenger, but he's going to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So everyone's got another question. That's just a simple answer. I mean, these are Orientalist, and I really don't... Uh, these are these Qur'ani yun, that they just were, love Qur'an, and they want to discount hadith. Unfortunately, we've got many in our own country, within our own ranks, and a very famous Pakistani, um, uh, Muhammad Sheikh. He's a very famous guy, and um, he lives in Canada now, and he's from Karachi, from Pakistan, and he was, he's known for debating, and he's a Qur'ani yun, he actually does not believe in hadith. The other fitna that you have in, the, in the Pakistan, even shaitan is actually shy of him. That's Javed Ghamdi. Even Shaitan says, I, I didn't know someone could be more evil than me. So that, that's Javed Ghamdi. And actually, the funny thing is, he's got following of over millions of people that follow him. That's the amazing, that, that is the irony. He said, you can even pray in, this is his fatwa, not my words. He said, if you live in the Western world, you don't have to pray Friday. That's his words. If you live in a Western country, don't have to pray Friday. And for Taraweeh, you can pray in front of the computer, that's fine. So next time, if you don't want to come you know, to the masjid, you're feeling tired, just put uh, the Salah from Haram and pray behind it. You get the reward of uh, praying with the Jama'ah. And these are the, the people, they're funny people, they've got many, many cases. And SubhanAllah, our country is no... Uh, uh, you know, not safe from any kind of controversy, like uh, the Qadiani, the guy who came from, he came from South Asia. I mean, what, and if you really look at that land where he was promising paradise, he also has paradise, did you know that? Rabwa. So if you buy, and to get uh, a piece of grave in Rabwa is very expensive, because if you're buried over there, then you're buried in the paradise of the Qadianis. So, and Rabwa is actually in Pakistan, if you didn't know that. You can actually go and visit that place as well. Uh, Pakistan has the majority of the population now. Yeah, yeah, that place is in India. Even, you know, all the three factions of Pakistan, the three main groups of Pakistan, the Deoband, India, 
and then you've got the Barelwis, Bareli also in India, and then you've got uh, the Qadian. They're all these, you know, mashallah, they're from, I call them the brothers from another mother. Like they're all like always fighting against each other. Pakistan's got the two major groups. And if you've ever seen the Ramadan time transmission, you've got one clown, Amr Liaqat, as one clown, and they bring another four clowns. And you, you don't have to go take your children to circus. If your children understand Urdu, circus is in front of you. Enjoy 45 minutes of your life. Wallahi, when I am bored, I watch Amr Liaqat. Why? Because he gives me entertainment. That's entertainment for me. You know, rather than wasting your time watching something else, just watch this clown. And you've got, mashallah, a country, you know, I, well, I'm blessed, you know, I'm from that land, but uh, the only thing which is missing in my blood that I wasn't born in that land. So I can't debate that Allah chose me not to be born there, but the ones who were born over there, mashallah, you guys are holy. <laughs> Muqaddas. You know, you call yourself Sharif. You're from the Shurafa that you were born in that land. But well, having said that, you know, there's many great scholars were born in that land as well. One of the greatest scholars, even the Arab believe he's a mujaddid, Shah Waliullah al dahalawi He was actually born in that land. That's one of the greatest scholars that you can actually read or learn. Even the Hanafis love him, even the Ahl al-Hadith love him, everyone loves him. There's one guy that no one actually challenges. Shah Waliullah al dahalawi he was actually born in this land. So yeah, next time when you're bored, just watch Amr Liaqat. You know, he's got a lot of uh, programs happening. Inshallah, we'll leave there. If anyone's got a question, I'm happy to answer. If not, we'll just bring it to a close, Inshallah. He's following you on YouTube. Who, Amr Liaqat? Oh, then I have to close my channel now. <laughs> if I've got that guy in my subscribers, then there is a problem. <laughs> SubhanAllah, this is in Pakistan, mashallah, you know, I, and I said this before as well, and you guys are like my family, and I speak my mind always when I come over here. It's like in Pakistan, if you speak with a British accent, mashallah, the biggest alim in the world. And if you speak with the Australian accent, you're the second kind of an alim. If you speak with the American accent, then you're a mujaddid. And so everyone, mashallah, they, they, we are just amazed. Yeah? You know, there are so many clowns that have come out of Pakistan, no, not to mention there's one in Melbourne at the moment, Haris Sultan. I don't know if you guys know him. He's, he's called Pakistani Mulhid. The word, so he calls his channels called Pakistani Mulhid. So he's the one who says, I don't believe. Mulhid means the one who's denounced the religion. So he is bagging... Uh, all the ulama of Pakistan every day and he's got a following of close to 80k subscribers on his channel and he actually does speeches in Urdu and English as well and that's what the Pakistanis are, mashallah, we just get amazed, you know when someone speaks in a way uh, in English, English is just a language if I was born in Pakistan, Karachi, I'd probably be speaking with an accent today and I probably would have no following but Allah chose me not to be speaking like that. And this is what it is. See, our children, you see our children at the back, they do not like if we speak with an accent. You know, my son is the biggest racist, my eldest one, that I've ever seen. And no exaggeration. When I speak in a certain way, he says, I'm not talking. Like, what do you mean? I mean that's, how, that's how my father speaks. So you're not going to speak to my dad? So if I put an accent... My son says they don't want to talk to me. And we've got a new sports teacher in AIA. He's from Egypt. And my son said, you know what? I thought this guy was um, uh, like he would speak English. And we asked him something and he said something. We were just about to laugh because the way he was speaking. And poor thing, he's just come from Egypt. What do you expect? It's not going to be speaking like Scott Morrison. So... You know, we have to give accents or nothing. Wallahi, if uh, I was born in the other part of the world, I would still be proud in the way I spoke. The way I speak, I mean, this is what I got. Uh, you know what they say in Urdu, Khairat. I just got this in Khairat because I grew up and I went to school and I learned people and I looked at them and I, they spoke like this. 
And when I speak to my son in any other accent, he just cries. He says, no, no, you know what? Don't talk to me like that. Don't talk to me like this. So this is my eldest son. And so, but, but my all other children are very good. Like, they don't mind if I speak like any other accent. But I'm telling you, even our children are like that. They would make fun of us. So if we speak and say some words in a particular way, they make fun of us. Or oh, you, you know what, Baba, you don't say it like that. You say it like this. It's like the children in the classroom today, no exaggeration, in the classroom when the teacher makes a mistake of saying a particular word. You know, for example, I said this and the children are trying to correct me. Uh, you know, there's a word, you guys from Australia, you say yogurt. In the UK, you don't say yogurt, you say yogurt. The word is yogurt. So when I said it, and they're looking at me and they're like, no, no, you don't say it like that, it's yogurt. I'm like, yogurt in your house, but not my house. So yeah, there is some way, some words that we say differently to you guys. And uh, so uh, you're not going to teach me English. That was my first language. So I spoke it in a way. So I mean, there is no problem if uh, someone speaks in a different way, it really doesn't matter. All right, inshallah, jazakumullah khairan, inshallah. Next week we have no class, but if you want to follow me uh, with your swords, then you can meet me at uh, Quaker's Hill. If not, uh, we'll see you in a fortnight.